live long and prosper. I was going to Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. Lilu Dallas Multipass. Shut up and take my money. By Grabthar's hammer. <laughs> what a saving. One does not simply walk into Mordor. X never, ever marks the spot. Until he's coming. You're a wizard, Harry. Stay a while and listen. Hey, whole Kermit the Frog here. Your ties are cool. So say we all. This is a play on nerds. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode 63 of A Play on Nerds. As always, I'm Steve. And I'm Jarman. And we're your co-hosts for today and every other time that you listen to this show pretty much for the most part. It's true. Doesn't usually change up at all. Uh, And as always, we have a very special episode for you. It's so special. Every episode is very special. Uh, in this show, we're going to be revisiting another uh, recently new bit, uh, Retro Retrospective, where I have picked a movie that I love and Jarman has picked a movie that he loves that neither of us had seen each other's movies. And we're going to discuss them and, and talk about why we like them. Because we got so much feedback on the last one and everyone loved that segment, so we had to bring it back. And I'm being I'm lying here completely. Nobody said a thing. <laughs> so we're assuming you like it. Yeah, if we don't hear from you, we're just going to assume you love all this shit. <laughs> That's how it works, folks. That is. It's got to be a back and forth. That's also how the government works, coincidentally. <laughs> That's true. If you don't yell loud enough, we're just going to pretend we're doing a good job. Yeah, you must like what we're doing. <laughs> So are those protesters outside? Shut up and give them the hose. <laughs> Smithers, give them the hose. <laughs> Release the hounds. So what have you been up to, sir? Well, the big event is that I had a birthday and I yeah. turned 30 and I turned 30 years old. We're now the same age for a short we period We are. Of time. And we're now in our 30s. <laughs> Both of us were in our 30s. Even when I responded to that comment that that guy made, I just said we're in our 30s because I was close enough. Yep, it was. It's pretty depressing. Uh, so that was cool. Another cool thing is I became an uncle again. Jeez, sweet. It's like every other week here. I swear. There's just babies all over your life. Uh, me and the new kid, whose name is Jude, as in Hey Jude. Mm. Uh, we share a birthday. Very cool. He was also born on July 9th, so that's kind of a cool thing. And that kid's gonna eclipse me for the rest of my life. So I'm real <laughs> stoked about that. <laughs> Did you uh, do anything fun for your birthday? Uh, we, I did my version of fun, which is low key. Nice. Uh, my parents got, because this is what they do. They got me a gift certificate to Outback Steakhouse. Very nice. Because that's where we celebrated everything growing up. Same here. Uh, (laughs) So we went to Outback Steakhouse and Anna and I enjoyed the abomination that is the loaded (laughs) blooming onion. Yes. Which is a blooming onion and they take cheese fries with bacon and just slap it right on top. Oh, God. Just right in the middle. And then they give you the dipping sauces for both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I think they said that blue and onion, the whole thing is like 5,000 calories or something. It's not that much. It's in the thousand. It's over a thousand, know. certainly. It's not 5,000. I'm looking it up right now. All right, let's hear. Let's hear the Blumen calorie count. Blue onion calories. I'd say 2,100. Let's see. You, we can cut all this. <laughs> no, we're leaving it all in. All of it. 2,710 calories. Only 2,700 calories. <laughs> that being said, the onion that they use for this is a little bit smaller. It's not a full portion of either. So it's probably still approximately 2,700 calories, not the combined calories of the Bloomin' Onion and the cheese fries. Another place says it only has 800, and another place says it has 1,900. So I don't know. It's all over the place. Maybe it's like 1,900, but then if since you, you like lap up all that sauce and like use your fingers to get it, that That's probably true. is that extra 800 calories. <laughs> like, I just get my face in there. I'm like, oh, God, I gotta get every drop. But it was your birthday. You deserved it. Yeah, that's how I did it. And then after that, I had a porterhouse steak. Oh, God. <laughs> and we upgraded our sides to the steakhouse <laughs> mac and cheese, which is the fattiest oh, shit in the God. world. So, funny enough, my mom had just gotten a gift card from something for a... Uh, Outback Steakhouse. And I did the same okay. thing growing up. We went to st- Outback for some reason when we were celebrating something. It's not oh, that yeah. great of a restaurant. <laughs> no. But it's actually, I think, gotten a little worse. It used to be better quality. I, it could be in my mind. But I remember them having pastas and stuff. They had like two-page menu now. That was it. Uh, we get there. And what did I have? I had grilled chicken and broccoli. 
Well, that's because you're being healthy and stuff, right? I know, and it was depressing. because it is. I was going to be a little unhealthy, and I was like, I'll get your featured sirloin thing. And he's like, oh, we're all out of sirloins. So they were out of sirloins at a steakhouse. Yeah, that's like uh, in college, uh, I went to our like local student union ice cream place. And I said, yeah, can I have a milkshake? And they said, oh, we're out of ice cream. I said, so, so you're selling irony? Is that what's going on? Because that's Why are your I'm doors getting, shuttered and closed? That's all I'm getting right now is irony. <laughs> Uh, anyways that sounds like a good birthday though yeah uh and then Anna and i went to uh a local massage place i really like and i got a deep tissue massage and Anna got a prenatal massage very cool uh and then we spent all weekend watching movies that Anna normally won't watch with me but because it was my birthday i made her <laughs> like what movies uh the gremlins movies and national treasure i love national treasure <laughs> it's in the constitution <laughs> It's in the guts. It's in it. L- let me check behind this brick. Oh my god, a clue! <laughs> I'm gonna have to eat the Constitution. <laughs> no, Nick, don't don't eat it. Don't eat it. But it's, it's, to, pr- it's to protect it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the only other thing is uh, we went. You know, July Fourth happened. I think between last time we recorded and now, right? Right. That that's true. Uh, we went up to see uh, Anne's mom, and on the way up, uh, on a nice hour trip up. Uh, we got hit <laughs> on the highway. What? Yeah, we were in a little bit of an accident. We were going 65 miles per hour, and some young kid was in the left lane. We were in the middle lane, and he misjudged his distance or whatever, and just got gave us a nice little tap in the back left side of our car, front right side of his. Oh, so you didn't go spinning or anything, right? No, I mean, it, for going 65 miles per hour, it went as well as it could have gone. For sure. Uh, but he admitted fault. He screwed up. His mom's insurance is going to pay for everything. Uh, <laughs> well, so our car's good. in the shop. We have a loaner. Uh, but then also that weekend, uh, we took Anna's mom to go see The Shallows. Oh, how was that? The shark movie, right? It's the best shark movie. I, the, the review of the best shark movie since Jaws is accurate. Huh. Uh, they did a really good job with suspense. They got a lot of the really gratuitous boob and bikini shots out of the way in like the first 10 minutes. Yeah, because even Jaws had those. So. Like, they kind of just knocked it all out, and then it was like, all right, now we're in the movie. You've seen the boobs. We're in the movie now. So Blake Lively is actually a decent actress. I've never really seen her in anything. She really, I mean, she kind of has to carry the film. Most of it is just right. her sitting on a rock. And was it a really CGI? Uh, that's So that's really the one thing is the CGI for the shark at times was really good, and then at other times was pretty bad. I gotcha. <laughs> and it went between the two, but there were moments where it looked super real and super interactive, and then moments where it looked real bad. Maybe they had both. Maybe they had a practical and a CGI shark. I don't think there were any practical sharks in this. Hmm. Gotcha. But no, I recommend it. It's It was pretty good suspense, not quite a straight horror film. I'm surprised. That's good to yeah. hear. Oh, well, what have you been up to? It's been a while. We had Fourth of July and all that. I didn't get to do very much because my shoulder and neck all at one time went out for a week and a half. So I was wow. like bedridden for the first week. I could barely move out of the bed. So I got painkillers and um, and muscle relaxers. They didn't work. They didn't do anything. Um, so I, I don't want to take more of them or something because I don't want to become addicted to painkillers or something. So I just right. kind of I actually the best thing that worked for me was stretches. And my sister told me some yoga stretches and they really help. So I recommend that okay. people and heating pads. Works wonders. So I'm finally Dude, better. You're old. What I know, I'm 30. As soon as I turn 30, my body immediately falls apart. It's great. Well, I'm also going to the gym a lot more, so I probably did something wrong. It's like I mean. you're just out of warranty. <laughs> Your know. body knows it. It's just <laughs> shutting down. <laughs> I'm just out of warranty. <laughs> but uh, first of all, I I had unfollowed a lot of people on my Facebook list because you can you don't have to defriend people. You can just unfollow them because of the, the politics and that stuff. Yeah. I'm just kind of done with it. It's just too much. And there's horrible things going on right now, as we talked about in our last episode. We won't yep, bore that, that again this time. But so I unfollowed a lot of people and at least until the election's over, maybe I'll refollow them. But now the people I thought were safe are no longer safe because everyone's posting about Pokemon Go. Oh, I've been playing the Go. Oh, God. Every post is about Pokemon Go. <laughs> I haven't seen like, the, you know, the fads come and go, but I haven't seen a fad really sweep this way since like the iPad or the iPhone, especially this fast. Yeah, like, it immediately it's took everywhere. over. And I heard on the, the Nerdy Show, which is another podcast to listen to. They were talking about this months ago, saying that it could be pretty cool. They're not sure if it was really going to work correctly. They're like, oh, the release schedule is too fast. Like and then they didn't talk about it again. And all of a sudden it was released. And now it's just 
huge. So I yeah. mean, it, it is a great concept. It's really interesting. and I've been, I've enjoyed it. Now, mind you, uh, every Pokemon I have caught has either been in one of three places: on my couch, in my in my bed, <laughs> or or on the shitter. Because you're not going anywhere else. I have caught two Pokemon on the shitter. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> what kind of Pokemon were they? I got I got a Spearow and a Rattatat. Of course, there's a rat hanging around near near the shitter. That's right. Um, so no, I'm not one of these people. Like, I'm not doing what you're supposed to do with the game. I'm being a lazy prick. So if you live under a rock, and you know what we're talking about, uh, I'm sure you know what Pokemon are if you're listening to the show. But they basically made a app for all smartphones now, a game to where you use your camera, so it can actually find uh, Pokemon in the real world. So you hold your camera up, and you won't be able to see the Pokemon in front of you, obviously. But if you can see it through your camera, as if it's sitting there in front of you in your your surroundings yeah and they use your gps and your maps so they're located you'll find water type pokemon next to actual bodies of water i mean it's really amazing they've done this it's kind of revolutionized things so it's pretty cool but that's that was just it's everywhere and, and i think really what this marks is i'm, I'm going to say this is the first successful application of augmented reality right absolutely people have tried and failed numerous times this, I'm going to say, is the first successful attempt. And uh, there's only been one. Everyone has that friend or friends or multiple friends who is the outrage person. They represent the Internet who gets outraged at everything. Um, and I have a person I know online. I won't say any names, but they have found a reason to be outraged about Pokemon Go. OK, go on. <laughs> Their reasoning is handicapped people can't do it as well. It's not fair. What does that mean, even? <laughs> I mean, being handicapped is awful, and we would never take anything away from those people. That's that's horrible. But they're now used to the fact they can't do everything a perfectly able-bodied person can do. And doing things that are purposely against people who are handicapped or not able-bodied, they call it being ableist. Which is it's a not like term. all the Pokemon are located at the top of a set of stairs. Yeah, and like you said, you caught most of your Pokemon <laughs> on the shitter and on your couch and your bed. Yeah. And I so... Mean, I I think that I'm outraged that that is the reason they're outraged because that's telling that's assuming that people with disabilities can't do things. That's true. And it's like, Fuck yes, that person that they can get in their wheelchair, roll down the street and catch a squirrel. That handicapped. is what they want to do. They're not even handicapped. They just like being outraged about things. Oh, my but, God. And just certain people can't do certain things like I'm left handed. Nothing is made for me. There you go. Those ableist <laughs> bastards holding you back. You know, So now I'm outraged at that outraged person for the reason they're outraged. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah. I just had to share that because I was just uh, too pissed sh- off about that. Does that person <laughs> listen to our show? No. Good. I don't want him to. <laughs> I don't want that kind of viewer. Uh, me neither. All right. So I guess we're moving on now to some nerdy news. Then. Nerdy news. It's time for nerdy news. What you got for us, Steve? Uh, so I've got. A story and, of course, a funny name to go along with it, and that is Shorthanded. Hmm. Uh, so they have found a new dinosaur that they have finally uh, completely, they, they were holding off announcing it until they had found a full skeleton, and they have finally completed that skeleton. And it doesn't have a cool name yet. It's Gualico Shinye. So it's got some weird scientific name. Uh, and it is a relative, uh, a distant cousin of both the T-Rex and the Velociraptor. And what they're finding interesting about it is it is the third type of dinosaur they have found that was a big carnivore, huge jaw, giant heads, huge legs, and tiny dopey little arms. <laughs> it was the first one to have that? No, it's not the first one. That's the interesting part about this is that they've got those short little arms with just two fingers on them. Um, it's the third time they've found this. but these these are not devolved from an ancestor um, or anything like that. All three of them developed this trait independently. Huh. So for some reason, evolutionarily, there was enough of a benefit for whatever reason to having dopey little arms. Have they cut any rumor or any theories yet about why they're, they were useful for something? I mean, my thought is big head, big jaws, arms get in the way. I guess. But then why do you even have arms at that point? Yeah. <laughs> you can like scratch your friend's back if you lean over real close. Yeah, it could be something about weight distribution. 
you know, if they had giant arms, they would have had to tip forward or something, or their tail would have had to be massive to counterbalance the weight or so, you know, it could be something stupid. Sure. But whatever it was gave those animals enough of an advantage that a bunch of them evolved this exact same trait completely independent of one another. That's so weird. Yeah, it's actually pretty cool. I almost thought like it would be the same thing as the caveman. Like one of the first cavemen they found was a Neanderthal, but he had he had some kind of um, skeletal problem. And that's why he looked like he was hunched over and looked like he was almost like the hunchback of Notre Dame. <laughs> but they said so for years, they thought that's just how Neanderthals looked like these, you know, cavemen, they're hunched over. But no, it's just that particular one they found had severe back problems. <laughs> <laughs> so all the new Neanderthals they found were stood upright perfectly fine, just like the rest of, you know, other humankind's. But that's what I thought was with T-Rexes. They just found one that had screwed up hands. <laughs> Maybe the rest of them had normal arms. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. And then here's something else cool. This is not related to shorthanded. This is just a neat <laughs> story. So the, the Amazon rainstorm has been studied for 300 years, where samples have been taking things have been being classified. And uh, they have officially announced that in 300 years, explorers have found a total of 11,676 different species of trees. Jeez. That has nothing to do with animals, flora, you know, the, the plant life and bugs and, you know, but just trees. They have found almost 12,000 different varieties. Just in the Amazon rainforest. And that blows my friggin' mind. That's a huge amount. It's, it's just insane. I mean, not to mention they constantly are finding new animal, you know, animals there. Oh, all the time. And, and by tomorrow, there will be 10,000 less of them because we're just going to burn that shit. Probably. Or it'll be flooded over by, you know, man-made we'll climate build change. A, we'll build a dam or something so we can open a <laughs> resort. Trump Towers. It's just called Fuck Mother Nature. <laughs> Anyways, uh, uh, well, <laughs> I gave mine kind of a little name. Hey! My story is Reaper in Russia. Ooh, that sounds it's interesting. Fun. Yeah, so <laughs> this is actually a really fun story. So... Apparently, there is a practicing real Batman in Russia right now. Um, he's right outside of Moscow, and okay. it's a crime-ridden place in general. Lots of gangs, lots of um, drug smuggling, and he has... Uh, uh, there's been a few video taken of this guy. He's basically wearing a souped-up Batman costume okay. but with more armor on it. So he's actually wearing like body armor, so if he gets shot or stabbed, it won't work very well. Um, but there are a few pictures out there. Uh, I'll try to remember to post them in the show notes. But he has a Twitter account and people can tell him about what they see around town. If they know where a known hideout is of crime or, or gangs and that kind of thing, he'll go there. And there's one instance where he went into a building. This guy watched him do the whole thing. Uh, there's a known building in that, in that area of town for being always has tons of drug smugglers and crime there. Uh, they hear tons of screams and yells and like people being hurt. And then he walks out of the building, drops down like a Molotov cocktail that apparently they had thrown at him. And just like stomps it out and then walks away. And they have video of him coming out doing that. <laughs> and so uh, the cops came a few minutes later and picked up two of the criminals. And they were like totally beaten up and like bloody. But they were alive and they're they're OK. So he's actually making progress in Moscow like <laughs> as Batman. And it's pretty badass. <laughs> but he calls himself the Reaper. That's why it's called Reaper in Russia. And he has his own Twitter account. Um, I can't quite see here what its Twitter handle is, but it's a J N E C Grim Reaper is his name on Twitter. Wow. And he's pretty badass. I mean, especially in Russia. That's a scary place. Is that your future? Is that what, is that what you're getting all souped up for? <laughs> what, me? <laughs> getting in yeah, shape? <laughs> put on a Batman costume, go beat people up? No way. I'm a wuss. I would never put myself in harm's way on purpose. <laughs> Unless I'm protecting someone. Well, I now I about. have a new life goal. There you go. You should become the Reaper of of San Jose. <laughs> and every time you punch somebody, you say, do you know the way to San Jose? <laughs> that's awful. Uh, well, yes, yeah, so that's my dirty news. And then I get stabbed just yes. over and over Just again. like in the movie Kick-Ass. Yes, exactly. And then you eat the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> I have to protect it from Sean Bean. <laughs> Does Sean Bean die in that movie? Uh, no, I think he's arrested in the end, though. Oh, that's too bad. He goes to prison. He's stabbed in prison, and then he dies. That's, <laughs> that's how that movie ends. So I guess we'll go ahead and jump into a retro retrospective, huh? Hey, the, the fans have been yelling for it. <laughs> Their silence is deafening. It's right. <laughs> I'm giving you a night call to tell you how I feel. 
So, if you don't mind, I think we should talk about Drive first, and I have a reason for that later, but... Alright, let's talk about Drive first. So, Drive was the movie I picked, that I, one of my favorite movies, uh, for Steven to watch, because he had not seen it yet. And yeah, int- I, I had seen the first five minutes. So, what, what, was, what is Drive about? Let our fans know. Drive is about a lonely guy who only understands cars and driving. He is a professional driver in every sense of that, of that phrase. Uh, he makes a emotional connection with a woman and her son, and through dealings with the mob and a deal gone sour, he ends up uh, having to hurt people, threaten people, and extort people, essentially, uh, to protect them from the mob. Mm-hmm. The Jewish mob, no less. The Jewish mob, I don't that's know. right. It's unusual for a movie. Um, and in the end, it all kind of ends up okay, really. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty yeah. good. And he's like a, he's a Hollywood stunt driver by day, works in a, you know. Uh, Mechanic shop part time. And yeah. And his kind of his boss is played by Brian Cranston, which is pretty cool. And he's sort of an aspiring, like, in uh, indie car driver. Yeah. He's about to be. And Christina Hendricks, you might remember as uh, the gorgeous redhead from Mad Men. That's right. Um, she has about four lines and then gets shot in the head in this movie. So yep. that's, that's cool. Brian Cranston and uh, what the uh, Ryan Gosling and Albert Brooks plays the, the Jewish mob boss. Yep. And uh, Do- uh, Poe Dameron. I don't know his actual name. Uh, Oscar Isaacs. Yes. Oscar <laughs> Isaacs shows up and plays the ex-con husband of the woman and father of the kid who Brian Gosling makes an emotional connection with. Right. So uh, what did you think? Oh, and Ron Perlman. Ron Perlman, yes, Ron he's great Perlman, in this movie. Just being a sleaze. I love it. He's great it. in every movie. Um, there were aspects of this I really liked. I liked that it was a movie that it showed you instead of told you. Right. You know, you understood that he was a little bit reclusive and didn't quite have the, um, you know, so, social skills, I guess, to some extent or another. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. And they could have gone into that or or tried to explain it. But instead, there's a scene where he's in a grocery store and sees this woman and her kid who are his neighbors. And instead of going past them, he turns around and goes down a different aisle. Right. To show that he just didn't want to be in that social situation. They showed it instead of telling you. And every time someone talks to him, he like barely responds, if at all. (laughs) He's like, oh, he's got the so few lines. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Something I read about this I was found was fascinating. Um, the screenwriter for this was a guy named Hossein Amini, who also wrote Snow White and the Huntsman, which is not a very good movie, which we've also reviewed in the show before. Yeah. Um, and apparently what happened was the director of this movie and a lot of the actors and producers all lived in the same house while they were filming this. And they cut out tons of the script and just tried to do as little as possible with just doing everything with looks and um you know camera angles music that kind of thing so the script that they he gave them was a already an adaptation of a book and they just cut all this crap out so it'd be very minimalistic so i feel like that's why it still turned out to be a good movie because they didn't let the screenwriter from snow white the huntsman (laughs) run away with it (laughs) that's right but once again they, they showed you they didn't tell you you know you got a taste of his dark side early Gosling's character the, with the whole like it, the, it basically starts with him in a heist and his deal is I'll show up. I will pick you up. I will wait for five minutes and then I leave and I drive. That's what I do. Whatever happens to you before or after that is none of my business, mm-hmm. but I will get you to where you need to go. Pretty badass. And, and you also, you, you know, even in that beginning intro where he's like kind of running from the cops and playing the avoidance game. You see that he's smart, but they show you he's smart, mm-hmm. not tell you he's smart. Yeah, not some like other gangster saying, man, this guy's the best in the biz. He can hide from any cop in the world. They don't need that line because right, right. he just, he does, just it. does it and they show it. <laughs> so the uh, overall, I really like this movie. Well, um, I will say there were some things that confused me about it. Choice wise, stylistically, like what? So. It felt weird that there were times where they felt they could show the violence and other times where they felt that they could imply it. Interesting. Um, you know, when you get to see Christina's Hendrick's head really blown off. Yeah. Like really, really blown off. 
But there are scenes with Ryan Gosling where like you didn't really get to see him stab the, you know, the Jewish mob boss. Right. You didn't get to watch him drown uh, Perlman's character. It's kind of like real far away. But for some reason, you got to see him stab a guy with like a, a not a coat hanger, but like a piece of a blind. Yeah. And then you also get to see him uh, stomp a guy's head in. On the right, but then they didn't show him shoot the guy with a shotgun. Yeah, it's it's odd. It, I wonder it why. It was it was just a strange choice that I tried to find meaning in. Like, oh, maybe it's maybe sometimes they're showing it as or something, but I couldn't find it. That's a good point. Yeah, there wasn't necessarily a rhyme or reason to that. That was weird to me, mind you. It didn't ruin the film for me. I'm sorry I didn't get to see him use the hammer that was so iconic in all the the posters. Right. <laughs> he only used it one time. Crush that guy's hand. Crush the guy's hand. And then I thought he was going to, at one point, he's got a bullet in one hand and the hammer in the other and the bullet's held to a guy's head and he's ready to hit it. it yeah. shuts it. And I was like, oh, please let us get to see this. This would be so friggin' cool. <laughs> You're sick, man. Oh, man. Uh, but yeah, that didn't end up happening. Uh, <laughs> so that, that confused me. And this is something that both Anne and I agreed on because she watched it with me. Mm-hmm. I really, the music and the soundtrack really bummed me out it really didn't do it for me oh it's one of my favorite parts of the movie it shifted between weird faux 80s synth pop and just noise i like the music that's one of the best best parts i was like god please stop oh man it actually inspired that game Hotline Miami, which came out and it's all filled with like 80s style synth pop that's all made recently. But uh, and it's a very hyper violent game. Right. And, like and, and sort of the, the, the weird theme song also just didn't do it for me. Oh, I liked it. I love the music. It's really popular soundtrack. <laughs> the, they can be wrong. That's OK. You, um, you're entitled to your opinion. <laughs> and your, your opinion can be wrong. Um, <laughs> that's true. But. No, that that really bummed me out and really kind of took me out of it a little bit. Not enough to ruin the film for me or anything, but it's I funny because there is an entirely different cut of the film with a bunch of songs from the Social Network soundtrack um, and other songs, and it was totally redone at the last minute with other songs. So there's actually a version out there you probably might like better, which is funny. Okay, I can get down with that. And then you know I liked Ron Perlman. It was tough having me. Uh, what's his name? Al Brooks. Albert Brooks. Yeah. Al- Albert Brooks. It was hard for me to take him seriously as the villain. I, I thought it was like amazing seeing him take that kind of character on because he's always playing comedy. Yeah. Um, I, I, I thought he played. Well. He's one of the geniuses behind The Simpsons, so he he gets a pass no matter what he does. <laughs> seeing Brian Cranston was cool. Um, and the way that Brian Cranston died was a little bit weird. Disappointing, kind of yeah, underwhelming. disappointing, underwhelming, and just un- unbelievable almost. Apparently, that was his idea. He kind of uh, proposed that idea to the director. Uh, it's interesting. Yeah, and then the whole the the whole Ryan Gosling breaking onto the film set to steal the fake head of the guy when no one saw him do it anyway, mm. and when Al Brooks still knew it was him that did it, so there was no point. That's true. I don't know why he wore that mask. It's like maybe a sign of him losing his mind or something. Maybe. You know, <laughs> but it, that was just a weird choice. Um, but then, but I do have to give them credit for the ending because the ending is what it needed to be. Yeah. You don't know what happens to him he, if he survives well, he, or. Well, he moves on. Right. It's obvious that he knows he cannot. He cares about her so much that he knows he has to leave. Now, for some reason, my memory is seeing this movie is that he left the money with her. And then he died at the end. No, he left the money at Al Brooks. Oh, no. And I I just rewatched it last night. And I'm like, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I was like, why do I remember this so differently? And apparently there is a cut out there where he does die. But I couldn't have seen that because that's that that wasn't released. So I'm like, why? My memory is completely different that she got the money and then he just dies at the end. It's weird. I don't know why I remember that. Um, But yeah, he doesn't die. He kind of drives off into the sunset. And in the end, it's it's where he started. It's him in his car and he's alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought that was very poetic in some ways. But o- overall, I would highly recommend this film. There were some parts that were confusing to me, and maybe somebody can explain them to me, or maybe there's a review out there that explains it. But otherwise, it was really good. Good. I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, absolutely. It's not one of your favorites list, but it's like, oh, I'm glad I watched that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't not. I wouldn't tell someone to not watch it. <laughs> so there are a lot of things in this movie that almost didn't come together to make it the way it was. So it was originally basically going to be a 
a generic uh, revenge action flick starring um, Hugh Jackman. And it had a director that had directed some B movies and had some mildly successful action movies. And so that was what it was going to be. And then Hugh Jackman dropped out. They replaced him with Ryan Gosling. And Ryan Gosling wanted a different director. He wanted this really kind of artsy, fartsy guy from, from Europe, Nicholas Winding Refn. And so he took over as director. That's the guy who kind of put in more of that music that he wanted to have there to make it and all the visuals being very strange and a lot less dialogue. And so it kind of became this more art housey film that it was never going to be in the first place. So I thought that story was very interesting how it came went from just being stupid, generic Hollywood movie to something very different. But anyways, I probably would have liked it, too, if it was a revenge flick with Hugh Jackman. That probably would have been fun, too. <laughs> That's true. It'd be very different. Yeah. So our next movie Melinda and Melinda. Melinda and Melinda. Uh, a very little-known Woody Allen film um, that came out... 2004. I mean, yeah, I was about to say, not that long ago compared to a lot of those films. About 12 years ago. Um, and, oh, my God. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> uh, over a decade ago, it came out. <laughs> yes. Uh, and it's the first film that he wrote the script but recognized he was too old to play the lead. Oh, and so he him. cast Will Ferrell instead. <laughs> so I watched this film without, thankfully, without looking up who directed or wrote it for at first. I just went into it blind and I was I had no idea what was going on. I was like, first of all, I'll say right off the bat, it felt a lot like a play. The whole thing it does. Felt like a play. It really does. Um, so it starts off to people who haven't seen this movie. Um, it's like four or five people sitting at a dinner table talking, having drinks. And uh, two of them at least are playwrights. One of them is a mainly dramatic playwright. The other one is a comedic playwright and played by Wallace Shawn. One of them, who's the guy who's like uh, inconceivable. That guy. Uh, (laughs) But so he's the comedic writer. And one of their friends at the table tells them a simple story about a woman named Melinda who walks in on a dinner party unexpected. And they don't really tell the rest of that story, but they then decide to tell the story of Melinda from a comedic point of view and from a dramatic point of view. And so right then I'm like, oh, this seems really cool. That's a great idea. So you go through with this one actress who is the same in both stories um, playing Melinda and the rest of the actors all change from the drama to the comedy and has a ton of known actors. uh, Chiotel Igel for how do you say his name? Chiwetel Igel for <laughs> yeah. I've said multiple times incorrectly. Yeah, Amanda Peet, uh, Will Ferrell, uh, Steve Carell has a tiny part in the uh, movie. Chloe Sevigny, Sevigny, Chloe or... Sevigny, or how do you say her name? Um, Josh Brolin. Josh Brolin has a pretty small part too. So a lot of people who is I'm everyone's just clamoring to be in a Woody Allen movie this at this point in 2004. Um, uh, Steve Carell shows up. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It'll tiny part. Yeah. Um, but then it gets into the film, and I have to say, great idea. I feel very poorly executed. And I don't want to be offensive about it, but I just feel like... No, no, no. Go for it. <laughs> because mostly there, everything felt awkward and unnatural. Because first of all, everyone in this movie is incredibly pretentious and white privilege like uh rich people talking about operas and you know oh i mean it's very woody allen <laughs> i mean in that respect like extremely well, woody allen early woody allen takes place in like new york and his dumpy apartments and he makes really uh, strange references to plays and playwrights and historical events and stuff that are weird but it's still usually you know average people poor people or even um but now this is just like the upper crust of society having their poor white people problems and you know their wine tastes bad or something i don't know but <laughs> i have some of the <laughs> one line which is the absolute worst oh chloe savenny's character says i haven't been to a dark bistro since college <laughs> i was like dear god <laughs> and that wouldn't be so bad it that would be it's fine it's a movie about you know wealthier people sure but just everything was done so awkwardly uh, one, one example of what I'm talking about, which happened throughout the movie, which was uh, Will Ferrell was going to go to an antique shop to buy an art deco thing of some sort for Melinda to buy her as a gift. He immediately walks in the store, goes right up to the front table, points at what he wants and says, gift wrap that. And then immediately turns around. It felt completely unnatural. Uh, another thing, they're going off the movie set with Amanda Peet. She's on working on a movie set mm-hmm. and she's I'm meeting a friend for lunch. She walks over to the nearest restaurant almost like on the movie set 
Her friends sitting there waiting for her already, and she goes, "Oh, wh why don't we sit here?" And points to these two two chairs, just saying they're readily available, and they sit down immediately, and the waiters immediately there, ready for them. It's like nothing felt natural. <laughs> it all felt like if this is all in a movie set, this is all happening in front of you, or like it's all in a play. Uh, maybe, like, yep. I mean, I guess that might be the idea, but it just. And even the dialogue felt stilted and like they didn't believe what they were saying or they're reading it off a page. And I, th I would say Melinda felt the most natural out of all of them to me, the actress playing her anyways. But that's my f initial impression. I didn't hate the movie yeah. yet, but we can go into that more. What do you what do you think? So I, I think that what you're pointing out is that something I love about it is that it is like a play in that everything in, in it is made to make the plot move. And there's not meant to be really any resistance to the plot. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Like everything is in place to make things move forward, just like it would be in a play. And unlike that's most true. Movies. Yeah, there's no there's no conflicts of like getting from here to there. Like you're just gonna get there, and it'll happen. Right, right. right. Walks into a store, says that gift wrap that, and then like walks out <laughs> just to make the plot move. Yes. I love that. Um, but that's actually one of the things I find really endearing about this film is something that you hated. <laughs> It just, it, I didn't say, I, I would say I hated it. It's just like, this feels so unnatural. What is going on? Why is, is it purposely this unnatural and strange? I don't know. So, I mean, um, if it was purposely. I think it was purposely that unnatural and strange. Okay. Cause yeah, cause other Woody Allen movies don't feel that way. So I don't know if he did that on purpose or not. And, and honestly, you know, I like, I, I like the Will Ferrell half of the story better. Yes, I do too. Then the more serious part, I would, I could see that being a whole movie on its own. Right. Um, but I like the mood swings that the other plot gives you. I thought it was real. I laughed, actually, when he says, and then her story got a little darker. And he goes to Melinda. <laughs> she's like, actually, I killed my lover. <laughs> it was like really over <laughs> yeah, at the dinner party. I loved it. No, no. She was only alone with. I thought that was right at the beginning. She went to Elijah for when she oh, says, oh, yeah, I, I murdered my husband, my, or my hop, lover. Hopping in the middle of the conversation. He's yeah. like, it sound, well, it sounds like you had to. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I'm going to jump out the window. <laughs> and that's also like a play coming in in the last possible moment in a scene where it can still make sense. It, yeah, yeah. That it is was, such a playwright thing. So I guess it makes a little more sense thinking about it in retrospect since it was being told by two playwrights that yeah. it's supposed to feel more like a play with that kind of unnatural expository dialogue. And uh, yeah, so I guess it makes me appreciate a little bit more after thinking about it that way. Right. But also, I didn't notice Woody Allen until towards the end of the movie. Will Ferrell goes complete Woody Allen, like with his voice and his, he's like basically impersonating Woody Allen at that point. Yeah. Especially the scene with the soup, the uh, Playboy model in his, in his apartment. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute. And I looked up online and I was like, written, directed by Woody Allen. Of course, it all makes sense now. <laughs> so it was definitely different though. A very different kind of movie. Yeah. Uh, but it's one of those ones that I appreciate the little nuances and the funny little moments. And so I don't know. how are you introduced to this film? Um, I honestly don't even remember. Hmm. I think I was working at Blockbuster and had a free rental. <laughs> That'll happen. Like, I think that was how it occurred. And it was on the shelves. Back Maybe in, someone recommended it. I don't even remember. That was the year we graduated high school. 2004. Right. A good so this would have been years like ago. four years later after I graduated college with a degree and was working at Blockbuster. And somehow Melinda and Melinda was sitting at your Blockbuster. That's exactly right. That's how that works. <laughs> Uh, so if you haven't seen this movie or well, some trivia for apparently Robert Downey Jr. was originally cast in Will Ferrell's role. Winona Ryder was originally um, in the title role with Melinda, but then uh, her shoplifting arrest happened and no one would insure her. <laughs> yeah, same thing for Robert Downey Jr. His insurance premium was too high because he was in the height of his like on and off again drug use. <laughs> oh, I loved uh, there's a Chicago reference. That I don't know if it's on purpose, but when she's telling the story, Melinda, about how she had killed her lover and she got off on the charges because she told the lawyers that we both reached for the gun. <laughs> <laughs> That's the defense that she uses uh, in the Chicago to get off from killing her husband. So I thought that was pretty funny. I mean, he's, he loves play, so it probably is. And, and one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie is where like Amanda Pete wants to set up Melinda with uh, her dentist friend. Mm hmm. Uh, and they, they get to go to his like really nice place yeah. and they go inside and he's got all those trophy animals. And this is Josh Brolin character. Josh Brolin is a total bro, like <laughs> millionaire dentist. Uh, and Will Ferrell just starts badgering him. I love that. What is that? Is it a pig? No. Hey, Greg, 
Did you shoot this? Well, actually, I, I shot all of those. Twice a year I go to Africa. The experience would take your breath away. Huge herds of kudu, greater kudu and lesser kudu. Wow. Wh which is bigger, the, the greater kudu or the lesser Holy. kudu? You know, I've always thought that it would be the sexiest thing in the world to just sleep out under the stars, yeah. the middle of the jungle. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, it'd be great if you don't mind waking up with a python in your sleeping bag. But no, 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 they have beds. The whole thing is very civilized. They have beds and bathrooms and showers, the whole thing. But no elevators, right? In case you're being chased by a tiger and you have to get up into a tree. Are you kidding? It's not fun. I, I can't climb, so I'd have to take the elevator. I don't understand. <laughs> right, Me you, neither. Did you shoot all the furniture that we're sitting on? So, um... How quickly was it shot? Have you ever shot a gun? Freshly shot? Uh, and then we're out on the plane shooting a uh, greater and lesser kudu. Which one's bigger, the greater or lesser kudu? <laughs> <laughs> did you shoot this furniture too? Is this where you, did you find this in the jungle? <laughs> With those badgering moments, uh, just, just so good. He's like just, jumping up and down on a, on his outdoor um, a trampoline. Trampoline, thank you. Yeah. The, oh, there we go. Josh Brolin jumping up and down on a trampoline and outdoors house, outside his house. Like, join me to Will Ferrell's character, and he's like. I'm not doing that. <laughs> He's like, I'm good down here. <laughs> how do you get, don't you get, how do you get exercise? He's like, uh, usually anxiety attacks or something like that. <laughs> so Woody Allen. It is. It goes full Woody Allen eventually. So I recommend this movie. It sounds like Jarman may not, but no. you have to be in, you have to be in for like a quirky movie. Right. Like you have to know that's what you're walking. And into. I think if I walked into it knowing with Woody Allen, I think I'm more open to it being just very strange in different directions. So after seeing it, I didn't hate it or anything. I was just like, this feels really unnatural. And like, is this just bad acting? These are good actors. Like, what is going on? So yeah, there's a lot of good actors. in it. I feel like it was a slight miss because you should be able to go into a movie not knowing who directed it or wrote it, but and still enjoy it. But I think it's good overall. It's just it was odd. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly performed. That's all. That, yes, that is accurate. And I will say, Drive had 87% on Rotten Tomatoes, and Melinda and Melinda has 55. <laughs> uh, Melinda and Melinda had a better soundtrack. <laughs> I disagree. <laughs> oh, do you like Tchaikovsky or Brahms or Mozart? There's <laughs> <laughs> some Gershwin thrown in there. I don't know. Damn right. <laughs> so that's our retro retrospective, huh? Check, yeah, check them out. Both movies that we love for whatever reason. No matter how wrong either of us are. So I guess that moves us on to... To trailer reviews! Trailer reviews! Here to Play on Nerds, we have developed an interesting rating system to bring to you our ideas on the trailers we're about to review. At the low, low end of the scale, we have Burn It! where we think you should find every copy you can get your hands on and throw it into a barrel fire. Kill it with fire. <laughs> and our next step is Drunk Watch, which means that, yeah, I'd watch this movie. It'd be entertaining if I was under the influence of some kind of substance of some kind. But if I was sober, probably not going to check this thing out. No, nope, not going to see it. Next, we've got We'll See, which is maybe we just don't know enough about this movie to tell what the hell it's going to be. Could be good. Could be bad. I'm not sure. Eh. And our next category would be Get the Couch Ready, which means I'm definitely going to check this movie out at home. Wouldn't necessarily pay the big bucks of see it in theaters, but I'm definitely going to watch it at home. So get that couch ready. After that, we have Take a Look, where we are recommending for you, our viewers and listeners, to check out this movie and check out the trailer and tell us what you think about it. We, we wanted to see what you guys think. It looks pretty good, but we're not quite sure yet. Yeah, take a look. Yeah. Let us know. And for our final and best category, we have Shut Up and Take My Money. Shut up and take my money. This looks so awesome. We're going to see it. That's where we cannot wait to give Hollywood big wigs all of the money that we have earned at work to go see a film for $47. We're so excited. We just have to go see it. We, have, we don't have a choice. And that is our A Play on Nerds official copyrighted trademark system for rating our movie trailers. All right. So what do you want to talk about first, Steve? Uh, let's talk about the one that I've seen more trailers for and I think shows more of what it's going to be about. And that is Morgan. I hadn't seen this trailer before today. Uh, I had seen a teaser and then maybe one other trailer before this. Hmm. Before the most recent one, at least. Gotcha. Amy! Don't go in there! Oh, my God. We're all very happy to have you here, Lee. I imagine that's not exactly true. Doctor, this is Lee Weathers from Corporate. I'm just looking for some information. 
about Morgan? Morgan was our third attempt, our little breakthrough. It's the next step in evolution. It's bioengineered with synthetic DNA. Within a month, walking and talking. Within six months, it exceeds our wildest expectations. I'd like to discuss the incident, if that's okay. She had a tantrum. There was joy in her heart before we shoved her back in that box. You feeling a little sad, Morgan? Yes. Do you like it here? Yes. What do you like about it? I like my friends. Do you think they treat you like a friend? I mean, you think it's normal for friends to lock each other in cages? What would you do if I recommended that you should not be allowed to leave this room? What if I recommended that you be terminated? We should end this. Answer me! What would you do? Where's Morgan? Initiating lockdown. What you don't understand is... Ten. Morgan is still evolving. Nine. The people in this house are in danger. Eight. It needs to be terminated. Seven. Six. Don't be afraid. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. I'm starting to feel like myself. So Morgan appears to be about some sort of company owned or possibly government um, bunker housing um, a girl who is the result of a genetic experiment where they're messing around with genes and, and artificially messing with them. Like you do. Like you do in movies when you want a good plot point. <laughs> that old chestnut. Um, and she kind of becomes too big for her britches and develops psychic powers and suddenly decides she doesn't want to be their lab experiment anymore. And so this seems to fall somewhere between, I don't know, a sci-fi or a thriller, maybe a horror skew. A little bit to of it, each. But, but I honestly can't tell. And the trailer is cut in such a way that it could really be completely different from what we're expecting. That's true. That could be on purpose. Uh, it's got Kate Mara, who is most recently in the Fantastic Four or Fan Four Stick. Um, Fan Four Stick. But she's actually a great actress. But they, she's, she's just wasn't. She a made movie. a bad choice. <laughs> yes, like, like you do. And Paul Giamatti is in it. Um, he basically does whatever movie they ask him to do. But he's he's great. Uh, and then there's the girl, the redhead from Game of Thrones. You know nothing, Jon Snow. You know, oh. you know nothing, Jon Snow. That you know nothing, Jon Snow. <laughs> you know nothing, Jon Snow. I like her. Something qu about her. She's just this different kind of beauty. I don't know. Uh, like an like an ugly beauty. <laughs> like got like got hit in the face with a. She's not with, ugly. With a shovel beauty. No, I think she's hot. Um, I'm not saying that. I've known some kid, some girls with messed up faces that are sexy as hell. Well, there you that go. Doesn't, that doesn't mean their face is messed up. <laughs> well, at least say that she's sexy. Are one of their male actors? No, I didn't think I recognize anybody else besides Paul Giamatti, um, as far as male actors go. But uh, yeah, it looks pretty interesting and creepy and kind of cool and kind of fun. Yeah, what's I, I'm going to end up giving this one a we'll see because honestly, I they really could skew it in so many different ways at this point. Right. And based off the trailer that we watched. And I just out of all the actors in it and the, the story, I general story, I put drunk watch slash get the couch ready because I probably would want to watch this eventually. But I'm not jumping out of my seat to go to the theater to see it. Yeah. I remember when this movie was called Splice and it was terrible. And Ex Machina. And Ex Machina, <laughs> which was better. Yes. Ex Machina was good. I didn't mind. Splice was Splice was terrible. Yeah, it was pretty rough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next movie is A Monster Calls, and this is a story about a boy who dreams up his own monster who basically kind of helps him with his life problems psychologically, and uh, it's not the BFG, <laughs> which just came No, out. and honestly, I looked at that and I was like, really? This looks so much like BFG. Uh, and just according to the trailers alone, I think this looks better than the BFG. I haven't seen I mean, that. It has Liam Neeson. So right. Liam Neeson plays the voice of this giant monster creature that this kid creates in his mind. You're called a monster. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are you ready? There we go. What color is that? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe 
Maybe if we take a pencil. And then we make a face. And then we see the life in the eyes. Life is always in the eyes. <gasps> There's a monster. How does the story begin? Was the boy too old to be a kid? You're coming to live with me. Don't touch anything. Too young to be a man. I no longer see you. <laughs> what did he do? He called from Monster. Whoa. Whoa, indeed. I know everything about you. The truth that you hide. The truth that you dream. I'm sorry you have to face this, but you have to be brave. Do you understand? What shall I destroy next? Break the windows! Break them yourself. It's okay that you're angry. I'm angry too. And if you need to break things, by God, you break them. I wish I had a hundred years. A hundred years I could give to you. I'm afraid. Of course you are afraid. But you will make it through. For this is why you called me. Come on. I think it looks good. Probably a tearjerker, inspiring. Um I'm I'm also gonna give this one a we'll see because I don't, this is nothing. There's nothing to go off of. <laughs> well, there was a whole story there in the trailer. Yeah, a kid gets beat up and then he goes home and a giant hand grabs him. That's not a story. Oh, it shows his mom dying of cancer and everything. Did you not watch the same trailer I did? Apparently, I did not watch the same trailer <laughs> you did. <laughs> Apparently not. Yeah, there's a story. Right, hold on. Let's take a two second, two minute pause. <laughs> okay. And let me see if I can find the trailer that you saw because the trailer I saw was fucking nothing. You're like, what are you talking about, German? <laughs> All right, so we just took a break. Steve watched the trailer, and you're doing <laughs> the right trailer. You're doing what now? <laughs> I'm changing my vote from "We'll see" to "Take a look" because the new trailer actually gave me an idea of what the movie was going to be. Right, like this kid leads a, a sad life, and he needs a friend and some confidence. And so he and so he makes one up. Right, the monster with yeah, the looks, form of Liam Neeson, with like an unnaturally low, gravelly voice. I will find you, and I will kill I, you. I know everything about you. <laughs> I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. <laughs> but uh, the, the effects look really cool, and like, I think just more uh, real-to-life and interesting than the BFG graphics did. I don't know. It's just me. Yeah. Well, I actually, I hope this isn't the final finish of the CGI, because there's some stuff that does look rough to me. Yeah, that can happen. People kind of just... Don't do all the work on CGI these days. It's kind of leave it crappy. But yeah, take take a look yourself. It actually looks better than I initially thought. And I, I almost want a new ranking of, this is a long one. We'd have to shorten down, but meh, if it happens to be on, or if I stumble across it when I'm bored on Netflix, I'd watch it ranking. <laughs> uh, all right, we can work on something. Do we that. have that already in some form? I don't know. Maybe like stream it. I guess it'd be get the couch ready. Cause I'm not, but I'm not going to definitely watch it. Because Get the Couch Ready is like, I'm definitely going to watch that, but when it comes for the home release, you know? But this one, I'm so like... So, like, on a Tuesday <laughs> afternoon when I've eaten too much ice cream and haven't put pants on. And I've eaten a whole blooming onion. <laughs> <laughs> a whole blo- 2,700 calories. And I really got to sleep it off. And a porterhouse steak. <laughs> I can't move and the TV happens and to And the on. only thing that's going to soothe me is Liam Neeson's <laughs> gravelly voice. You eat too much. That's not good for your belly. You're going to pay for that. <laughs> I'm going to find me Lucky Charms, and then I'm going to kill them. <laughs> That's horrible. I need another spicy ranch sauce. <laughs> Put some bacon on those rays. <laughs> Ma'am, maybe you didn't understand. I said extra bacon. 
<laughs> anyway. <laughs> So you better leave all of that. In. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, so we're moving on to our <laughs> thank you section. Thanks, guys. Thank you for being a friend. Travel down the road and back again. Your heart is true. You're a pal and a confidant. And if you First, a Daniel Hitch on Facebook who responded to our. Somewhat depressing, somewhat serious episode last time. Um, he said, tough to call the first 30 minutes of this episode enjoyable. It baffles us UK listeners, the US gun laws, and the reaction from the voting from the voting officials. Then again, Brexit baffled the world too, so we can't judge. I'd love to discuss Brexit. Just give me three years to work on a PhD thesis and I'll get back to you. <laughs> Basically, and I'm a biased liberal, uh, I think, R- Remain voter? I'm not sure what that means. Maybe it's a typo. I'm a biased liberal voter. We screwed our country with with open arms. <laughs> uh, it's so complicated. Media bias, confused narratives, ill-informed and sometimes deliberately misinformed voting demographics. A liberal politician was shot dead for campaigning. Uh, for campaigning remain. Oh, remain. Maybe that means remain in the union. OK. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, by a mentally disturbed man. Oh, wow. Racist and xenophobic agendas. The list goes on. In the light of the Orlando events, it's most disturbing that hate crime attacks have gone up 57% in the last week. John Oliver did a great spot on it if you get a chance to watch it. Although watching it back right now, it seems so tame. Imagine if New York State ceded from the U.S. and deliberately abandoned the Constitution in favor of autonomous legal rights, fired the mayor of New York in favor of a right-wing zealot, agreed in principle to kick out all immigrants and force all native New Yorkers to return but New Jersey and D.C., uh, we're we're trying we're tr- we're trying our best to convince them otherwise. Like I said, it's complicated. Wow, that was wow. quite the response, Daniel. But thank you, yeah. Thank you, Daniel Hitch, to giving us some insight into what the hell's going on. So we think that there's tons of shit going on in our country. There's just as much crazy crap happening around the world in other people's countries. Oh yeah, absolutely, there is. Oh, that's nuts. And on a lighter note for that episode, David Kramlich, who I believe is also Captain Hot Dog, uh, one of our old listeners, and he's a good friend for the Ten Forward podcast. I think this is in response to me saying I'm now freshly single again. He said, thank God you're like 22, 23 with many good years ahead of you and not in your 30s and started to go down in value. How do you feel about cats? Live long and prosper. (laughs) (laughs) And Steven, I think you did respond to that. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we are both in our 30s and I love cats. Yeah, cats are great. It's all I need. And as of this episode, I'm officially in my 30s. It's, it's It's a thing. The time I wrote that, I was lying a little bit. (laughs) <laughs> just by a few days oh man well please let us know if you uh, enjoy that segment if you don't like it otherwise, we're just gonna keep doing it otherwise your silence will be golden and we'll just That's go right. forward just like the government we're just gonna do what we want <laughs> unless you tell us otherwise over until and over you again. O- overthrow us <laughs> like brexit like brexit exactly brexit break it, this podcast every time i hear brexit brexit i can only think breakfast yeah it makes me hungry every time Every time. <laughs> and then I want a loaded blooming onion. <laughs> <laughs> Three loaded blooming onions and a porterhouse steak. And then dessert. I, th- I thought there'd be more cheese. <laughs> I wanted more cheese in this blooming onion. Is this it's Australia? Okay. <laughs> bring, it, bring it on my salad. <laughs> this is not authentic Australian cuisine. Bring out the kangaroo that cooked this. <laughs> Oh, my sides hurt. Uh, I know what side splitting means. All right. So once again, Internet, thank you for joining us. We will keep being your co-hosts if you keep listening. Thanks again, Internet. Stay nerdy, my friends. If you'd like to find out more about us, you can always check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash a play on nerds or check us out on Twitter and Instagram at a play on nerds. We're also streaming live game content all the time on twitch.tv slash a play on nerds fun videos and stuff to check out youtube.com slash play on nerds. And also please subscribe to us on iTunes and leave a review if possible, because that lets us be easily searched in the iTunes search index for podcasts and that way we know if we stink exactly let us know if you hate us or you love us that's always great check us out at our website www.playonnerds.com where all this content can be found at the tip of your fingers and you can also always email us at anything at a and then check us out on i guess snapchat 
maybe <laughs> for dick or, sticks or tumbler <laughs> tumblers periscopes uh, you could also throw a rock at us with a message on it carrier pigeons we accept cassette tapes <laughs> i love cassette tapes we just want to hear from you yes please send us anything you like at any social media outlets however you do it check us out and how you're already recording yeah i'm re- damn it i'm recording i was about to start <laughs> Are you recording? Let's just double check. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Let's see. This new A Monster Calls trailer is simply stunning. That's the name of this link. Oh, it's introduced by Liam Neeson. Yes, it is. I'm going to share a preview. <laughs> I'm a monster with a very... Enjoy the preview. Certain set of skills helping children. <laughs> just taken, but he's a monster. <laughs> you took my friend. I'm going to find you. I will look for you. I will find you. And I will kill you. <laughs>